Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our this week Rutgers Infusion AI seminar. And today we are very glad we have the, the invite Professor Jason Seal from the Arizona State University to give us this talk. Professor Seal received his PhD degree from the University of Michigan in 2010. From 2010 to 2013, he was in IBM uh, Watson Research Center. And uh, since 2014, he has been with Arizona State University, where he's currently associate, associate professor in the School of the ECE. His research interests include efficient hardware design of the machine learning and neuromorphic algorithms. Professor Seo was a recipient of the IBM Outstanding Technical Achievement Award, NSF Career Award, and the Intel Outstanding Research Award. And he has served on technical program committees for SEC, MLC, Stack, D Date, ICANN, and the many prestigious uh, technical conferences. And uh, so Professor Seal is a, a very famous uh, pioneer, uh, pioneer and researcher in the deep neural work and uh, neuromorphic computing algorithm and hardware co-design. So now let's welcome uh, Professor Seal to give us this talk. Oh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to um, present this talk today at the Rutgers Efficient AI Seminar. So today I'm going to talk about some of our recent um, works on energy efficient AI ASIC designs. And I'm going to present two um, of our um, works, one on CNN Accelerator for computer vision, and the second one is LSTM Accelerator for uh, speech recognition. Okay. So as you all well know, um, you know, deep learning and AI has been very successful um, and has been really changing our lives to name a few um, things around us. You know, several years ago, DeepMind and Google have come with this AlphaGo and they have some series of AlphaFold, some of this, um, you know, StarCraft. And we all pretty much have many um, AI devices like speech recognition or uh, personal assistant devices. We see a lot of you know, self-driving efforts that are um, driven by neural networks and AI algorithms. And, and Amazon also put this cashless store um, where we hear there's a lot of computer vision, hardware and algorithm going on. So um, if we first look into the computer vision side, um, CNN has been one of the <clears throat> convolutional neural networks have been the de facto algorithm. So, you can see on the left side that image recognition has been one of the really um, driving applications with this massively labeled um, thousand class ImageNet data set. Um, but yeah, and you can see the scale of just to still get one inference done, we're talking about billions of operations. And then the circle size here represents how many weights or parameters are there in one model. So we're talking about millions or, <clears throat> excuse me, tens of millions of parameters. And some of the other well-known computer vision applications are object detection, real-time um, segmentation, as you can see, um, that is uh, very useful in the self-driving or drone type of applications. And besides computer vision, another, uh, uh, sorry, so the, the, in the computer vision set, as I said, um, the convolutional neural network is the de facto algorithm. So if we have a peek into this one, um, it consists of this convolution. Um, layers, um, some of the like batch normalization, some nonlinear um, activation, some of the pooling layers, and we'll be we'll have maybe you know several to even thousands of very very deep layers nowadays, and it can be followed by a couple layers, a couple of fully connected layers at the end. So there's um, this exhibits very large number of computations as well as weight parameter storage and in typical um, CNN's convolutions account for more than 90% of the total computations. Besides computer vision, speech recognition has been one of the you know, very well exercised um, algorithms. And um, there are a lot of different classes of the neural networks here too, but um, due to the sequential and kind of uh, time dependent features in these um, speech tasks, the recurrent neural network has been one of the well, on algorithms here. So in terms of automatic speech recognition or ASR, um, there are a lot of commercial devices, as you know, like Apple Siri, Alexa, Google, 
um, Samsung, and they consist of typically they have kind of a front end always on keyword detection with, you know, you speak a keyword and it ignites the speech recognition part, typically still requiring some internet connections. Um, but overall, recurrent neural networks have shown good performance for these kind of sequential and speech tasks, but they also require a very large memory and computation for both training and inference. So our um, interest obviously is toward enabling on-device um, speech recognition, on-device computer vision, um, especially for devices with stringent power budget. And to do that, we look into algorithm hardware co-design of LSTM for speech recognition tasks. So uh, among different RNN variants, um, LSTM is a type of RNN with internal gate to scale the inputs and outputs within the cell um, long short-term memory. Um, so compared to like a multi-layer perceptron, um, it is known that LSTM with these different matrix vector multiplication and all of these Ws um, need to store these matrix of you know, array of weights. So, uh, for the same number of neuron um, layer, it will require like eight times the weights due to all the different computations and storage going on here. So it really exacerbates some of the storage requirements um, that we need to take care of for hardware implementation. So I just, you know, touch upon the surface of the CNNs and RNNs and um, due to this very complex algorithms, there has been very strong demand um, and efforts on this custom chip design for AI uh, and across uh, major industry players like Samsung, IBM, I, um, NVIDIA, Tesla, Amazon, Google, and many startup companies nowadays. And obviously more uh, radical stuff being proposed and demonstrated by academia. There are many uh, of these AI chip um, and AI ASIC accelerator have been presented and are being designed and more will come down the road. So along that line, um, we, my group has also been working on many um, of these uh, AI chips. And today I would like to present these two um, chips that we recently put together. Um, so one, the first one is a deep CNN accelerator with some specific features on conditional computing. And then the second one is LSTM accelerator with hierarchical structure sparsity to really push down the limits of the weights. And finally, I'll summarize my talk. So first I'll go through this deep CNN accelerator. And this has been published at CICC 2020 and has been invited for a special issue of JSAC published in 2021. So first let's look into several um, prior ASIC works on deep CNNs for um, that demonstrated image net data set performance. So um, this UNPU from KAIST uh, published in JSAC 2019 um, reported average uh, or peak actually 4.7 tops per watt energy efficiency for VG16 for ImageNet and it features some unified DNN core architecture and support for variable weight precision from 1 bit to 16 bit um, via bit serial processing. Um, this EOS chip standing for Enhanced Output Stationary Chip um, published in TVLSI 2020 um, showed support for various CNN models from BGG to ResNet to MobileNet and for MobileNet V1 it showed 0.95 tops per watt performance and it features two separate you know voltage and frequency domains for computation and memory and in this JSCC 2020 paper um, by Michigan called SNAP um, they presented efficient processing of unstructured sparse CNNs, which is typically not friendly for hardware. And they try to tackle that problem by associative search, channel first data flow, and some partial sum reduction. And they um, reported 3.6 tops per watt for ResNet 50 model for ImageNet. So there has been a lot of progress here, uh, but I would like to say that the prior work, some of the redundant computation in the steep CNNs are not considered and also um, DRAM controller has not been really designed on chip. So first, why is you know, DRAM you know, important? So we looked into some previous slides that showed like you know, the CNN model can include tens of millions of you know, weights and with some finite precision, you cannot really store all of that or it's not really a good way to store all of that in global SRAM buffer. Otherwise it's just gonna consume too much area or leakage power. So 
Um, typically, we have like a DRAM that stores all the weights, and then you have, you know, uh, relatively middle um, intermediate size of this global SRAM buffer and try to deliver that to this systolic array or um, arrays of PE. And this option DRAM access will have to happen between the DRAM and on-chip memory. And as you can see, it, the normalized energy of the DRAM access is very high, right? So it's very important to not only minimize like the on-chip memory access and the on-chip communication reduction, computation reduction, but it's also important to really understand the system level um, implications of this on-chip DRAM access. Uh, but due to some of these direct memory access or DMA and other IPs, um, it's not really has been easy to include some of these controllers directly on chip that can directly access the DRAM. So typically, um, test chips have been using, let's say you design a CNN chip, and then at the board level, you use like a daughter board to connect to another FGA. Um, and this FPGA board will have like a DDR or different DRAM, and then you can access through the FPGA, the board level, not necessarily directly accessing it. Um, so there's some um, kind of unnecessary overhead, but it's because some of these integration are not really um, straightforward or easy. To that end, in this um, CNN accelerator work, we would like to point out two novelties. The first one is a new conditional computing scheme where we want to largely reduce the unnecessary computations that are typically there in DCNNs, especially with pooling operations. And uh, by doing that, we also want to synergistically combine zero skipping. And then secondly, tackling this DM controller um, issue, we implemented and integrated um, custom off-chip DRAM controllers. So from the on-chip module, we can directly access some off-chip DRAMs, and that way we can really um, kind of look into uh, what the DRAM access are and how that impacts the overall system level performance. So we looked into the system level energy efficiency improvement uh, with this DCNN inference. Okay, so um, there are two proposed schemes. The first proposed scheme is called precision cascading. So the High level idea is that this type of max pooling is commonly used in deep CNNs. And in this max pooling, you basically do this, you know, full convolutions for let's say these four pixels. And then out of these four pixels, you will choose the max value. And then that's going to go on to the next layers. But the other values that you computed are going to get discarded, right? So you do all the computations and then they get unused. So in a sense, they are wasted, but obviously you have to do that because before you do it, you don't know which one's gonna be the max. So, but at least to tackle this kind of problem, we propose to, let's say for a given, you know, bit precision like N bit, and then we want to divide, let's say the input into a group of smaller precision um, groups. And then let's say we do, you know, the MSB group first, um, and then that will be like an approximate convolution. But just from the approximate convolution, sometimes this two by two maximum pooling value might be already known. So if we know that, then we don't have to go through the, you know, LSB part or middle part of the convolution from the input group. So that's what we want to really try to reduce here. So um, based on um, this approximate convolution, as I said, if the convolution results of the MSB group of four activations can reveal the maximum, then we can skip the convolution operations of the LSV group that we know they are non-maximum convolution outputs, right? So here we show the example of the precision cascading. We first perform the convolution operations with the first MSB group of input feature, check the maximum value. If the maximum value is found, then we skip the convolution operations of the LSB groups on the non-maximum cases. Obviously, um, if the partial convolution results of the first group um, might not reveal a maximum, and there might be a tie and so on, then we perform convolution operations with the next group where the convolution results keep accumulated before we find the max value. And if the convolution results in the second group reveal a maximum, then we skip the convolution operations for the rest of the groups on non-maximum convolutions. And as we go through these steps, we finally obtain the output of the max pooling after accumulating the maximum value and the convolution results of the rest of the groups only for the already determined maximum case. 
So the main advantage of you know, this precision cascading scheme is that we can reduce the you know, bitwise or groupwise convolution operations. And to understand how much savings that we can get if we assume several parameters like the p by p times p and the denominator means the total number of convolution operations. Um, and this p by p over n indicates a number of first group convolution operations. And if the partial convolution results of the first group can reveal a maximum, we can compute the convolution operations for the rest of the groups on only the maximum convolution outputs as n minus one over n. Um, it, that, but obviously there could be, you know, we can might go to the other group, but this is the maximum savings that we can get and maximum reduction ratios we can get. So if we, if the P is two, and then let's say N is three, um, then um, putting the number in, we can reduce the convolution operations by about 50%, by about two X. But obviously there are some overheads such as when we go through these loops um, in the previous slide, um, there will be some latency overhead and that can incur. So we obviously have to consider that as the system level. Obviously we want to minimize such overhead while um, getting a lot of reduction here. And one thing obviously to note is that this um, precision cascading scheme is trying to really exploit some of these redundant operations that happen in the max pooling layer. So, but in CNNs, there could be convolution layer that are not followed by max pooling. So this is gonna be obviously uh, applied and exploited on the layer right before the max pooling layer. The second scheme is full zero skipping. Um, and we know that rectified linear unit or different activations can lead to many zero activations. And you can dedicate clock cycles to it. Um, if you, you know, multiply with zero or add zero, obviously not gonna change the result, but basically these are gonna result in wasted clock cycles. And these are redundant max, not gonna change the value, but you're still dedicating time um, for them. So, we ideally want to employ a so-called full zero sifting scheme where we load and store only the non-zero value of the input features. So as you can see in this figure, using if we use some kind of sparsity map um, to indicate where the non-zero values are, then we can compute the convolution operations with only non-zero values, which is going to reduce the number of max um, that we actually compute and the access time of the memory. Uh, however, for this kind of zero skipping only scheme, limitations exist when using parallel computation on the spatial domain, such as like the three by three kernel window and cross all the input feature maps, right? Um, but overall, we're proposing to combine these two actually, and we actually find some synergy when we combine this. So when we combine this precision cascading, uh, and zero skipping, they can actually address some of the limitations of the PC only and the ZS only scheme, right? Because if we, you know, break down these um, input uh, into three different groups, as an example here, there's gonna be more chances of this small group being zero versus the whole input to be zero, right? So there's definitely, as we break down the input into smaller, you know, precision groups, then there's more chances of the sparsity gonna happen. And then we can, there's more chances to skip them. And those are found in this, you know, simple example of this um, BGG for ImageNet. And you can see that the baseline percentage of you know, zero activations is shown in the blue. And if you see the MSP group or LSP group overall, you can see that much more sparsity is gonna be fine in the smaller groups here, right? So we devised an efficient hardware architecture for this PC um, plus ZS scheme. So first we um, needed to maximize the effect of the um, zero sipping scheme in terms of parallel computation. So the left um, figure, case one, shows the case of parallel computing across the nine input features in the spatial domain. The simple example here has three input channels, nine output channels, and nine MAC units. In this case, we can skip the MAC operations for zero data, but we cannot skip the cycles for the computation of zero data. So the total latency will be 27 clocks or cycles, and then the MAC utilization can only be uh, 52%. On the other hand, when we employ the parallel computing, in this case two, across nine output channels at one pixel, 
we can skip not only the Mac operations, but also the cycles for zero data. And that's obviously good. It's going to reduce the total latency to execute a given model. So we can reduce the total latency to 14 clocks and the Mac utilization in this simple case is increased up to 100%. So overall, it can be seen that to maximize the effect of zero skipping scheme, the best way would be to load and compute input feature at one pixel across multiple channels um, in our proposed efficient architecture for this PC plus Z scheme as shown in the case two figure. That way we try to really um, not only fully skip zero values of the input features, but also we skip the kernel feature corresponding to the zero values. Because if we don't, if we know that the inputs are zero, it doesn't matter what the kernel values are, the multiplication results is gonna be zero anyway. In addition, um, we hold and shift the partial sums um, to really finish the overall pipeline operation and to maximize the input feature reuse. For example, um, when input features at X comma Y are loaded into the PE array, each PE computes the MAC operation for different output features at different pixel locations, as you can see here. Then when the next input features at X comma Y plus one are loaded to the P array, each PE computes the MAC operation with the previous partial sums that are shifted, right? So some partial sums are, you know, we want to hold them in some on-chip buffers until they can be accumulated with the MAC operation in the PEs. So this is the overall uh, proposed um, deep CNN accelerator architecture um, that we put together. So this figure shows the you know, top level block diagram and the data flow, including the on-chip DRAM controller. So all input feature, sparsity map, and kernel data feature are stored into external SDRAM chips. Uh, this, so SDRAM stands for static DRAM. So it's part of, I'm sorry, synchronous DRAM. And it stands for one of the DRAM um, chips are available commercially. So input feature, sparsity map, and kernel feature within the size of the tile are stored into the on-chip memory. And there's going to be data controllers for input and kernel features to transfer these input kernel feature data into the PEs corresponding to the sparsity map. And then the partial sum controller can also transfer partial sum between the storage and PEs. And P array uh, basically consists of three by three um, PEs to compute um, MAC operations, and each of these have also have 18 uh, multiple and accumulate units to keep or move the partial sums. So um, to go into detail of some different parts in the overall architecture, um, this slide shows the on-chip implementation of the custom off-chip SRM controller that can directly access and communicate with this external memory. So we store three groups of input features and sparsity maps into the same SDRAM within different banks, as you see here. Then input features and kernel features are loaded from the SDRAMs within the size of the tile through the SDRAM controller to be stored into the on-chip memory. And as you can see um, in the SDRAM controller here, we implemented a custom SDRAM controller on chip to demonstrate real-time communication between our accelerator and the off-chip DRAM here. So corresponding to the sparsity map data, only uh, non-zero values of the activations are stored into the off-chip memory. And we don't store any zero values into this actual memory. Obviously, that's going to reduce a lot of this off-chip memory traffic. So after finishing the storage, the PE array starts to compute um, the MAC operations with the input features and kernel features that are loaded from the on-chip SRAM by input and feature data controller. Um, and our proposed accelerator um, can, um, consists of these uh, P structure that can compute three by three convolution operation most efficiently, but also can support five by five and seven by seven. Um, and P consists of the MAC unit, um, some you know, small registers, as well as the control unit. And the register holds the partial sums and the control unit shifts partial sums to adjacent PE, external register or um, SRAM. And the communications of the partial sums among the PE registers and SRAM are governed by this uh, partial sum controller. Um, and after some initial latency, the ninth PE um, generates final output features every cycle and all processes are fully pipelined. So this is the um, uh, 
HPE right here has um, 36 um, actually sub PEs that consist of Mac, Reg, and control units. And a group of three sub PEs as shown in the um, red dot rectangle here handle an input feature which can compute 12 output channels in parallel. The final um, precision cascaded results can go through the ReLU and max pooling modules and um, one million share the, the um, final output. And then the non-zero data and sparsity map are generated and subsequently loaded to, to the external memory by the SGRAM controller. So this is the 40 nanometer um, prototype chip um, that we fabricated through TSMC. And these are the high level chip specifications. The core area is nine square millimeter and the total number of Mac units is 324. And we used about 340 um, kilobyte on-chip memory to store um, different types of weight activation sparse map data. And at 0.9 megahertz, the test chip can operate at 400 megahertz while consuming 200 milliwatt power. So, uh, aided by our fully um, zero skipping scheme that only stores non-zero values of activations, we achieved um, 5.8x and 1.4x reduction of DRAM access um, in convolution layers of BGG16 compared to um, IRIS or this TBLSI um, paper, respectively, as shown in the highlighted in the activation um, data going back and forth between DRAM and the red color here. So the required total DRAM access of inference for one image um, then turned out to be about 31 megabyte for the weight and then 24 megabyte for the, uh, sorry, 31 megabyte for the activation and 24 megabyte for the weight respectively. And this um, slide shows the measured chip performance uh, and power measurements. So you can see that Dynamic voltage scaling affects the performance and leakage power all the way from 1.2 fully functional down to 0.6 volt. Um, and then this, um, this um, pie chart shows the power breakdown um, due to some of these partial sum control, it consumes a relatively large portion, but it's relatively evenly split out between the PE array, um, other global controller and SD RAM controller here that directly accesses the off-chip DRAM. And then first, let's look into the energy efficiency measurements for the VGG16 for ImageNet data set. So obviously, we want to see how much improvement we're getting due to this combined PC plus CES. And then to do that, we, you know, we showed like four data points in certain layers, basically without any PC and DS, that's the baseline. If we only apply ZS, zero skipping, and if we only apply precision cascading, and obviously when we apply everything together. So um, the red circled layers are the layers right before max pooling. So that's where obviously we can apply the PC, but all other layers can still apply the zero skipping here. But obviously the energy efficiency gain are gonna be um, the most in these um, convolution layers before max pooling. So in average, we get about 2.4X improvement in the tops per watt energy efficiency. Uh, if we only count the max pooling, I mean, convolution layers before max pooling, we get um, a much larger improvement of 5.8x. And then the peak energy efficiency here um, is 8.9 tops per watt, um, as you can see here. So one thing to note is that, I mean, ImageNet is a very large data set, but still the input image resolution is relatively small, like 220 by 220. And that actually limits in certain models how many max pooling layers can be inserted in you know, DCMMs. Um, so for autonomous driving or medical imaging type of applications where much higher resolution input image are used, um, there could be certain models that, you know, where more max pooling layers are inserted in the overall DCNN, then, then the system level wise, we can expect um, higher energy efficiency improvements as well. So besides the image net, we also um, try to characterize this, um, one of the optical flow um, convolutional neural networks called FlowNet, which is a well-known network. And this used this flying chair um, data set. So we did a similar experiment on the um, layers here and here in this flow net model, they you know quite frequently use the max pooling right after convolution. So you can see that, um, especially in this layer, 
um, we get very high um, boost that results in about 70x improvement for the convolution layers that are followed by max cooling. But even if we include all the layers, we get more than 10x improvement in the energy efficiency. And for this overall model, the peak energy efficiency was 28 times per one. So if we compare to prior um, CNN accelerator ASIC works that demonstrated um, different models for ImageNet data set, you can see that um, our 40 nanometer chip by exploiting the conditional computing and the zero skipping um, reports uh, one of the highest energy efficiency um, and throughput numbers um, for this VG16. And also it features this custom off-chip memory controller that uh, help us to really characterize the system level um, analysis. Okay, so shifting gears, um, second um, part of the presentation is about this LFTM accelerator with hierarchical structure sparsity. And um, this work has been published in several papers, including 2019 ESS CERC. Um, this was invited for a special issue in JFSC 2020. And the algorithm part also has been published in Interspeech Conference in 2020. So compared to um, LSTMs or even MLPs, LS, I mean, uh, CNNs or MLPs, LSTMs really need uh, large compression. This is because due to the matrix um, kind of array weight that I alluded to in the beginning of the presentation, there are many, many weights and uh, storage you know, concern is really limited for on-chip adoption. So, LSTM um, has been provided, you know, one of the best uh, performances, for example, for phoneme recognition for TIMID or word uh, speech recognition for like liberal speech data set. Um, and obviously some of these um, LSTM dedicated accelerators are there, the literature and our work is one of those as well. So due to the 8x increase in weights compared to the same number of hidden layer neurons in MLPs, we need really large weight compression. Um, and there has been some works, especially considering the hardware as well. Um, as you can see here, either pruning base or you know, sort out and you know, find out the top K weights, for example. Um, so the pruning base compression um, is basically based on magnitude of the weights and it can reduce the computation memory footprint of RNN hardware. But this element-wise um, sparsity that will incur when we try to prune out the weights in magnitude fashion, and that can have quite some um, index memory and more importantly, irregular memory access that can hurt both performance and power. To that end, structure sparsity has been, you know, um, investigated by many researchers, including us. So this is aiming to reduce the index memory and to enable regular memory access. So um, some of the works include block circulant matrices for RNN, as you can see here. Um, but some of the accuracy has been um, affected by the FFT and inverse FFT hardware modules that are required. Um, there has been this ICLR 2018 work that in, um, invest, uh, presented this low, row or column-wise sparsity, as you can visualize here. Uh, but the total compression was limited to about 3x for RNNs. And we also um, presented some earlier work on this blockwise sparsity, uh, but that was only considering these uh, multilayer perceptrons, and it was limited to 4x. So in this prior work, what we did in this blockwise sparsity is we, you know, first have an array, let's say 512 by 512, and we divide it into some smaller blocks, 64 by 64, it can be smaller. And then what we try is before training uh, even starts, we randomly select some of the blocks to be uh, selected with a certain probability. So let's say all the white blocks we're going to drop and only the color blocks we're selecting it and we're going to only update them during the entire training process. So it's kind of pre-selected randomly, but we're um, leveraging the capability of neural networks to adapt and train these color blocks to still get reasonable accuracy. And if the training you know, finishes well, then for inference, it becomes very straightforward to compress this with very minimal index memory because we only need one per block here. Um, and one step further, in this specific work, we looked into this hierarchical um, coarse grain sparsity. So what we do is 
we first selected a block, right, which is a little larger, let's say like 32 by 32 with a certain probability. And we don't stop there, but within the selected blocks, we can still choose even smaller blocks within it in a recursive manner, let's say eight by eight. So you can see some of the color smaller blocks are chosen within the 32 by 32 blocks, and we can still increase the sparsity here, um, and we can still maintain a single index per the smaller block. Right. So that way, after we go through this couple levels, and this can keep go on, but we found out that uh, considering the overhead, the second, I mean, two layer hierarchical um, structure sparsity was one of the sweet spots. And then we can, you know, compress it very nicely and get further um, improvement in the storage this way. So one thing to really understand, I mean, why the structure sparsity is also important is because um, the bit precision for the weights are keep reducing in the state of the art machine learning algorithms, right? So, uh, but if we keep doing the element wise sparsity, the index memory, how many bits we need per index is not going to change. Uh, and that has, that is orthogonal to the weight. It's just, you know, the matter of, okay, within this matrix where we have to find out and, you know, record where that weight is. So the overhead of the index for 8-bit weights was relatively smaller, for example, compared to the case where if we use like 4-bit or even 2-bit weights, then the index overhead is going to be larger and larger. So it's very important to really minimize that um, and um, still maintain higher uh, level of compression without excessive storage requirement for the index. So in this LSTM accelerator work, we first um, looked into the algorithm and try to adapt it. So we um, used the well-known Cali framework um, for TIMID, Tedlium, and also LibriSpeech um, data sets. So the extracted input features are used, um, the FMLLR features are used to train the LSTM, and then the DNN training and computations are performed using the PyTorch framework that we put together. And then we also use a post-processing uh, decode step to obtain the final accuracy computed um, through the Caldi framework for uh, speech recognition tasks. So to train RNNs um, with this proposed hierarchical coarse grain sparsity, um, obviously if you're doing the offsite training, we the baseline we want to minimize like the cross entropy error, for example, um, and we find out the weight gradient and we iteratively update that with uh, momentum and learning rate. So in this, I mean, we maintain the, you know, mostly the this baseline SGD based training process, but we, as I said, we chose this hierarchical sparsity blockwise um, sparsity map that we predetermined randomly in the beginning. So um, that kind of connection matrix are gonna be stored and that's gonna gate some of these white blocks. So those white blocks weights start at zero, will never get updated because the CIJ there is zero and those are gonna be uh, not affecting um, the overall training and the inference, we're gonna skip them entirely as well. Okay, so some of the algorithm results uh, for LSTM for speech recognition, we um, did quite some design space exploration. So the for TIMIT, we were looking into this two-layer um, LSTM with different uh, width or different number of LSTM cells. And then we looked into some of the single-level CGS, this two-level hierarchical CGS, and we look into the x-axis is the total number of weight memory. So you can see that overall, the, we want to go down to the you know, bottom left corner, right? We want to use less weights, obviously, while minimizing the error rate here. So you can see that the ACGS consistently outperforms the single level CGS. And this includes some of these random block selection. And um, fortunately, across different sizes of these, you know, first tier and second tier blocks. And um, if we use the same random block selection versus different random block selection, that signifies these two uh, lines here. <clears throat> the PER phoneme error rate and the word error rate are relatively constant. So that's good that we can choose any of these and then um, the randomness and the block. And we can even, you know, re if we use the same random block selection for all these four WX and WH matrices, then that's gonna even further save down and reduce the index memory requirement. 
So that was the algorithm. And then let's look into the hardware part. So the input features um, from uh, obtained from Kali, the FMLR features are quantized are, and fed to the LSTM hardware accelerator. And we compute the LSTM inference through the dedicated custom uh, hardware. And then the softmax performed on the last layer of the NN um, are conveyed to the Kali framework to do the final post-processing steps. So let's look into the LSTM accelerator chip architecture. So we have the input buffer getting this, you know, quantized and uh, quantized input features stream in to here. And then we go through the uh, MAC unit. There are some of the C and H buffer corresponding to um, different LSTM weight matrices. And then going to the MAC unit, we'll have an output buffer that's going to stream out in real time the data of this LSTM output. So the MAC unit obviously does the you know, matrix multiplication for LSTMs at the different SRAM modules store the I mean, up memory bank here and here store the compressed weights indices and the biases. The CNH buffer store the cell state and output state and we can support either a two layer or three layer LSTMs with layer by layer computation but due to the highly compressed weight aided by HCGS, we can store all of this 512 cell three layer LSTMs on chip into this um, two pairs of three memory banks. Let's go into um, each of the uh, modules in a little bit more detail. So um, LSTM, you know, dealing with the speech data, the volume of the speech obviously is much less than computer vision with um, relatively sized uh, images. So that's why we only use um, 32 parallel MAC units on each side here to compute the current state and the recurrent state. Um, and the weight inputs to MAC provided from the memory banks zero and one. And then the neuron input to the MAC are provided from the H buffer or the input select MUX. And then we basically perform the matrix vector multiplication because the HCGS has a very structured um, sparsity and we know, I mean, the per row, the total number of weights are gonna be fixed. We can actually aided by that maintain very high, almost 100% utilization of all these MAC units through the overall LSTM operation. Now let's look into the memory. So this design contains three memory banks, bank zero and bank one here. Um, so uh, they store bank zero and um, one store weights here, these two. And then bank two here store the biases and the selector indices, like which random blocks are you know, selected by ACGS. And the weight banks are separated into three sections, these W1, 2, and 3 containing weights for the corresponding layers. And the sections of the weight bank uh, that are not used are uh, turned on to uh, low power mode so that the leakage power is minimized. And the total memory of about 300 kilobyte or 2.4 megabit are stored on chips. And then looking into the uh, different buffers here. So this accelerator chip contains three buffers, the input buffer, the output buffer, and the uh, H buffer here. So the outputs are double buffered, as you can see here, to allow on one hand continuous parallel stream out and computation. So we can continuously, stream, you know, if it's a final layer, we want to continuously stream it out. If it's not the final layer, then we need to feed out, feed in this output of a given layer to the next input of the next layer, right? So inputs for the proceeding frame are stored for this continuous computation. And then the neuron inputs for previous time step are stored in this H buffer. So this is the LFTM accelerator chip and high level specifications. Um, we demonstrated first the TIMIT, TEDLIUM, uh, for a couple different uh, RNN layers and later also demonstrated uh, library speech as well. We get reasonably um, low error rate and very uh, low power for real-time speech recognition performance. And this is the HCGS prototype chip measurements uh, with this two-layer uh, RNN and three-layer RNN for Tedlium. So you can see that due to the you know, more things we have to go through for this larger Tedlium data set uh, to maintain the real-time performance, it can be lowered down only to 0.75 compared to let's say 0.68 here. 
and peak energy efficiency of about nine teraflops per watt is achieved. Um, and this is aided by the 16 mex structured compression for LSTM RNNs while um, only having a minimal amount of index, right? And one interesting tip to note finally here is that because we compress the weight a lot, actually the weight memory power is not really dominating um, the overall system power and now the logic dominates. So to do speech recognition, as I said, we employ some of the pre and post processing um, um, software from Caldi. So these are like some of the example speech recognition results from Tedlium data set, right? So there's, you know, in cases, these are exactly matching. In some cases, there could be some small errors between the golden transcribed test and what we did with the RNN chip plus the Caldi prediction. So comparing to some previous RNN um, ASIC works, right? Um, so there has been some FPGA and RNN, I mean, compression works on the FPGA side, but before this, um, some of these RNN ASIC works have not been really shown. And here we're showing demonstration of relatively large um, data set up to, you know, Tedlium data set with reasonably low um, WRs even amid the high level of compression. So uh, actually let's go to here. So in summary, um, I first went through this CNN accelerator with conditional computing. So here we went through this energy efficient precision cascading based accelerator for DCNNs and we integrated a precision cascading scheme together with the full zero skipping to exploit zero data significantly reducing the energy and external DRAM access. And this 49 minute should demonstrate high energy efficiency for image net, as well as flow net type of optical flow um, CNNs. And then secondly, we, uh, we presented this LSTM accelerator with hierarchical structure sparsity. So we did algorithm co-design for optimized HCGS based LSTM accelerator. Uh, and combining like a 16x number of weight reduction and about 4x precision reduction compared to software, uh, we can enable about 64x memory reduction for weight storage. And in the 65 nanometer CMOS uh, prototype chip, we demonstrated up to uh, 8.9 tops per watt for real time speech recognition for these data sets. And we actually also open source this HCGS code at this following link. And finally, we'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, Chaitali and Bisar from ASU, and um, the, obviously the students who carried out all these um, like high quality works. Minju Kim, who did the CNN accelerator work, who is now at Qualcomm, and Deepak, who did the LSTM accelerator work, who is now at Starkey um, Technologies, and also Jian Meng, who is um, pursuing PhD under my guidance right now. And I'd like to finally acknowledge my sponsor who supported this work and relatively large chip fabrication, um, including NSF, um, the Jump Seabrick Center, and as well as Samsung Electronics. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, James. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Very excellent talk. And. Um... Any questions from the audience? You are free to unmute yourself or input your question in the chat box. I, I think I can start with some questions. So, uh, so first, I, I think the idea of the, the integrating the uh, DRAM controller to the on-chip, this is very smart idea. So I was wondering, so for you, for this type of the customized controller, so uh, so it's different from those that the more general controller is that, so you specialize those that the zero skipping functions in that controller? Right, so that's yeah one of the main motivations of using um, this custom controllers and you know by doing uh, by having that we can as I said only try to store with some sparsity maps only store the 
non-zero activations um, to the DRAM and only obviously load them. So if we have quite some, you know, zeros due to ReLU and this, you know, broken down precision groups, then we can exploit that and just not go back and forth with the DRAM with those zero um, data, right? So, um, but also, I mean, so that's definitely true, but I mean, you can still kind of do that with, you know, some of the um, other like commercial systems with FPGA, but I mean, still that way there will be some, you know, when we try to characterize, okay, I want to run the CNN from layer one to layer 16, then the DRAM is always going to be in the middle, right? So um, if you don't have this, you know, direct access, then you will have to go through the FPGA and there's other, un, you know, necessary cycles that you really have to go through. And then you have to sometimes carve that out to really just report what's, you know, consuming the DRAM, but Sometimes that's not easy, but as we have this, you know, on-chip controller that can directly control and access DRAM, then we exactly know how many cycles that we have to, you know, spend or allocate to go to the DRAM, get it back, this non-zero data, and then go to the next layer on chip, right? So that way, I think it was a nice exercise that we can characterize this very uh, in detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh, I have another question. So regarding the hierarchical structure sparsity. So here the, the structure it uh, it is uh, exist like the in the kind of the, the block level or in within each block. It's in the block level. So it's um so basically, like at the end, we will have this hierarchical structure, but at the lowest level will either have one block, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, either we'll have one of these, let's say eight by eight blocks um, completely zero or not, right? So at the end, we're just saving this, only the selected kind of colored blocks, and then they will, uh, only those will update it throughout training and then then because all the white blocks are, we know that are zero, then there's no point on storing them even in during the inference. So we only store the uh, trained and selected blocks on, on chip, and then we can do efficient um, LSTM inference with very small number of blocks here. Okay, so that means that you only need to store the index of the each block, right? So, we, I mean, we do store the actual weight of the final blocks here. Uh, the index is minimized because we only need one index per eight by eight block, for example. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's kind of the, the um, macro index, right? Right, right, right. Okay. And, and also, yeah. yeah, yeah. And for also for each block, so the its own sparsity ratio is always fixed. So for example, so, each yeah, block I mean, only has like a four. Right, right. So points. within the block, as you said, there could be some additional sparsity, like element-wise, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't, you know, really do much about that. So, you know, we just do the eight by eight block and within that block, let's say a couple weights are still zero, then we still, you know, compute that um, oh. with those zero or very close to zero values and don't exploit further element-wise sparsity within the second level of block. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, and uh, and I have another question. So that's the sure, kind of sure. question, yeah. So in your talk, you introduce your work on like the CNN and also on the STM. So how do you, from the kind of, uh, from the perspective of hardware design, how do you view the current trend of the, the, at the algorithm side, those the, like the transformer and the vision transformers? So right now they're also kind of widely used in the, computer vision, language, processing, and also in the speech. So, but, but it looks like that the, uh, it's fundamental, it's kernel computation, it's just a simple matrix computation. And then, so from your perspective, do you see that any kind of the, the emerging challenges for the hardware designers to-, to Or transformer-based models? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, transformer, uh, as you said, for both computer vision as well as speech or, you know, NLP is certainly emerging and has been showing um, some state-of-the-art performance on the algorithm side. 
because of that, obviously, there has been, you know, some and many ongoing um, transformer accelerators as well. So I think in some cases, you know, still we have like a backbone of the like a CNN and then there are some encoder decoder modules and people I think try to customize and try to approximate when they can't where they can. Um, so that way, you know, some of, you know, different observations will be exploited, I think, for upcoming transformer accelerators and, you know, relatively transformers have shown very large size, even if we don't go to like GP3, for example. So I think sparsity, um, pruning, compression, I think those have been, you know, good uh, research works from the algorithm side, but that definitely will be also be uh, needed and driven by the hardware as well, I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, any questions from the audience? You can directly unmute yourself. And, and actually, I have a, a follow up question. So I'm not sure, sure, sure. I have a lot to ask. So, so uh, we know that you also do um, many in memory computing works. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you think about so, so this, like this, the sparsity and the structure? And uh, so, this type of the, the uh, algorithm innovation that is can right. be find results that the, in the new in-memory computing scenario? Right, right. Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, and due to the limitations, I just selected to cover these kind of digital ASICs um, works from my group recently. But as you said, we also look into, you know, some of these uh, mixed signal or analog in-memory computing, SRAM, RM type of things. Um, and there, yes, the it's based on these crossbar arrays that are, let's say, you know, 64 by 64, 256 by 286, these kind of crossbars, then those crossbars are there and those structure is rigid, right? So you have to map the weights. And then if you have element wise or small group sparsity, then you cannot really avoid storing them. You have to still store them. Maybe the you know, current consumption is less, but to, not, I mean, to skip storing them, then you really need, I think, some of these like crossbar aware pruning. So there are some prior works and we also had a recent PCAS2 paper um, that just, you know, look into eliminating the whole column for a given array size or only eliminate, at least eliminating like half of the columns. And then in memory computing wise, you only turn on half of the total rows and alternate, for example. So I think there are some of these um, things you can do and that definitely needs an algorithm and hardware, you know, co-thinking. So what you can do in algorithm has to translate to kind of good uh, actual storage without really storing zeros and like latency reduction in the hardware. Um, but at the same time, those should not really lose much accuracy. So that has to be well trained by some of these hardware um, aware algorithm training, I believe. But I think it's, you know, it's a, you know, very old topic, right? And I know you have been, you know, working on different aspects of sparsity for neural accelerators too, but I think still it's, you know, not easy, right? Like all this yeah. low precision, sparsity, um, different, you know, digital analog hardware. It's, uh, and, you know, when you, you know, come up with a new model and okay, obviously you want it to be as low precision as possible, as high sparsity as possible without losing accuracy, but that's always a challenging job, right? Yeah, always oh, kind of a trade-off, a balance. Yeah. Right, right. So it's just a... How much you know accuracy you can trade off, but I think there's you know still some difference, right? Algorithm people I think will you know 
obviously don't want any accuracy loss and even a small amount will be a really uh, big red flag. But I think hardware people might say, oh, it's only a couple percent accuracy loss. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so it's yeah, different uh, community have, have the different interpretation. Right, that. right. Yeah. So, <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So I think, yeah, students definitely need to, I think, understand some of these nuances and then um, ideally we want everything the best we want the best pruning you know best energy efficiency but as Bo, as you said it's likely always a trade-off and try to find the optimal point yeah and uh, my last question is, yeah so it's even more more high level general so uh, okay. we know that you you work on so many different uh, directions that the uh, classical digital CMOS and the mixed signal for the in-memory computing and also the neuromorphic you work a lot on it. So right now, so since you you are kind of so uh, cross domain, so how do you think about that? So what is the future of the, the efficient AI? I think I think yeah. you are the best person to answer this question. <laughs> Because you well, well, I'm not sure I'm the best person, but uh, I think it's you know, it's a good question. I don't think I have a you know perfect answer for that. I'm also you know keep seeking and looking into new algorithms that come out, and um, I think it's I mean some some works. Um, I mean, but at the same time, it's a very fast changing field, right? So yeah. I think, um, I think, so I think some of the, let's say deep neural networks and maybe neuromorphic are somewhat different um, in my point of view. I think still the deep neural network will be, you know, driven a lot by new classes of algorithms, whether that will be transformer or something you know, brand new coming out. And um, I think still there is a lot of, you know, diverse um, applications, right? I mean, cloud is cloud and then, you know, wearable or edge is edge, right? So I think these very, you know, small form factor, stringent power budget kind of devices, these type of different, you know, pruning, low precision with new models, high accuracy. I mean, this is um, as we said, it's never an easy job. So I think still, you know, uh, more research will come out, maybe not like groundbreaking, but still I think a lot of practical and useful things um, still a um, lot to investigate. Um, I think on the, you know, neuromorphic or spiking side, I think still people are trying to, you know, get inspired by some operations in the brain and think that's you know still very interesting and more neuroscience information comes out um, uh, in my you know two cents I think one of the best um, applications there is you know they I mean SNNs or these neuromorphic um, workloads deal with spikes right so um, that obviously has been inspired by how our brain works but if we try to, you know, tie some of these natural images or speech to like a SNN with spikes, then in the, there has to be some of these conversion because you have yeah. to, you know, translate like an RGB image into spike and that conversion circuit um, can consume quite some latency. Um, there is some optimizations going on actively, but I mean, it's something non negligible, right? So. Um, but on the other hand, there are some of these other types of sensors like dynamic vision sensor, um, similar audio that, you know, event based like cameras where only when certain pixel intensity changes by a certain amount beyond a threshold, then spikes are generated. So those sensor output are directly spikes. And then for those sensors, I think it's very natural to tie like a back end SNN and then from the front to end, front to back. It will be kind of an end-to-end, -end, you know, spiking format. Um, so I think, I mean, those could be, I think, some of the nice applications that these SNNs could shine, in my opinion. And we're also looking into those to some degree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your vision for the for this answer. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, just one thing I might, I mean, it's a different topic, but I mean, as you, as, as you said, there are uh, many students from your class here. So um, like I presented these, you know, two chips, right? That has been 
a lot, I mean, these two students put a lot of effort in. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we only hear about, oh, this is the, you know, new, new idea, like we implemented this nicely. And these are the, you know, best results we got up to the ship, but you know, have to say this, I mean, every research is difficult, right? But especially, you know, these uh, chip prototyping, I, you know, keep going back and forth, but it's just a lot of effort. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, new, yeah. new technology is always different. So for example, like the 40 nanometer chip, the CNN accelerator, we taped out the first chip and um, it didn't work, right? And we don't exactly know what it didn't work. I mean, even the basic things from the IO um, coming in and out, that didn't work. So something must have gone wrong. And difficult part is it's not simulation when you have the real hardware, you don't know what's you know exactly going on. Um, so then we have to tape out the second chip. So that you know goes through you know a lot of um, delay and you know effort again. And then even the LSTM chip, you know, we didn't have to tape out again, but I mean there has been quite some delay and you know, try to add this and some of the difficulty. So have to understand that these definitely require kind of persistent efforts. Um, but at the end, you know, when you get this thing back and you put together this PCB, mount your chip and see it working really with these equipment, I think that's certainly, um, I mean, students find it gratifying and um, obviously industry also likes those kind of experience. So yeah, I have yeah, to understand yeah. there, there, there will be a silver lining, but there has to be a lot of grind, especially for these prototype chip works so just yeah, wanted, yeah 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 it's very hard work for, to do the do the real tape out fabrication that is yeah. it's totally different from just a very log simulation and so on <laughs> uh, hi, but i think that is a very great experience for students yeah uh, hi professor uh, seal uh, i have one question yeah. Uh, sure. my name is jafan wang and i graduated from texas a m university uh, I'm now working in, in Intel. Uh, okay. So, so for your presentation today, um, I have uh, one, I think one quick question, uh, because uh, I cannot uh, quite catch up with your <laughs> your idea. Uh, so, for for today's presentation, you show us two uh, chips. One is CNN accelerator. Another one is LSTN accelerator. Right. Um, so, my question is. Uh, for these two chips, uh, are they just uh, accept the data from other part of the uh, uh, machine learning model, or these two chips will have some kind of uh, uh, super parameters uh, to tune them? Um, so... So oh, let's say the uh -huh, CNN yeah. chip, right? So CNN, yeah. I mean, for computer vision, this, this is like image recognition mostly. Mm -hmm. So then the input obviously is like RGB image, right? So uh -huh. we have a module that streams in input um, okay. of these, I mean, line by line um, or pixel by pixel images of this 224 by 224 image from off chip into the on chip line buffer. Right, mm -hmm. so we do get these, you know, pixel by pixel data through okay. some of these um, paths here. And then once we um, accumulate enough um, pixels, then we go through these first layer and then second, third layer and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right, And then for the LSTM chip, um, we're not getting raw speech data in, but as I kind of alluded to here, we use this well-known Taldi framework and they will pre-process raw data with either like uh, different um, features. Here we use FMLLR features. So the exact FMLLR feature will be the input of our LSTM chip. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so let me ask like this way. So once uh, these two chips are taped out, uh, mm -hmm. you don't need to tune any, any super parameters of them, right? They just uh, accept the data from the from the image uh, input uh, and then just do some calculation. So you're talking about the weights, right? Uh, right, yeah. Yeah, need, I mean, so to... the, 
Yeah, please. No, I mean, this is all, you know, digital. Uh, so it's going to have a one-to-one -one match between what the algorithm shows if you set the, you know, activation and weight precision to be exactly the same between algorithm and hardware. So we do expect if the algorithm with, let's say, you know, 8-bit AP precision produce this result, then the exact same result should be achieved by hardware. And we verify that before we tape out via simulation. And then, you know, those will be verified once the chip comes back and when we do the testing. So the weight values are fixed after training, and then we just load them onto the chip when the chip comes back. Oh, okay. So, so as you mentioned, the, the weights, they are fixed after training. So right. these weights are not the weights of, the, uh, of this to accelerate the chip, right? Those weights no, are... No, no, it, they, they are. They are, right? Uh... So, I mean, CNNs have weights in all layers. So we yeah. will load them when we compute that layer, right? So right, all right, these right. will have weights that are fixed after training. And then those fixed weights will be loaded onto the chip when we do the processing of that layer, for example. Uh, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so these weights will be used as input data to, to, the, to, to those two accelerate chips, right? I think the terminology is a little confusing. Typically, when we say input, that's talking about input activation or like frames and then weight. Um, I wouldn't really call it input. I mean, weight is weight. You know, input activation is input activation. Typically, uh, input activation is multiplied by weight and uh, do a lot of these max to get the convolution done, right? I see. Uh, so, okay, one, one, more, one more question. So, uh, for these two chips, once they are taped out, your algorithm mm -hmm. of these two chips uh, are fixed, right? Can I say it like this? Um, yeah. Okay, okay, I see. So in that, yes. after yes, tape out- I mean, so yes, yes but I mean, the, the thing that is fixed is, you know, which algorithm, which let's say CNN or LSTM model we can run, right? But Let's say even after the chip is fabricated and chip came back, let's say we come up with a different, you know, SGG training or, you know, error function or something that the model structure didn't change, but we use some different techniques to modify the weights a little bit differently and that resulted in a better accuracy, then those new weights can be loaded onto the chip. That's no problem. But we cannot all of a sudden you know, adopt a very radically different model structure, for example. Uh, okay. But these weights are programmable in the chip, right? So um, for a given model, after the training is done, those are fixed. So likely we will just load them onto the chip, but different, you know, algorithm technique change the weights in a different way for the same model, then those different weights can be loaded onto the chip as well. Okay, I see. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks for the uh, interpretation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. So if no more questions, so let's thank our speaker again. So thank you, Professor Seal, yeah. to this very thank excellent. Thank you. That really learned a lot. And thank also you for having me. And also thank everyone for attending our this week's seminar talk. So. See you guys next week. Okay, have a wonderful day. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.